As I mentioned before, we have a special guest with us, and uh, Pastor Tawa graduated from, uh, uh, what is it called, Eve, sorry, Edmonton Baptist Seminary, now Taylor, uh, just over by Matana's house on 23rd. And uh, he's been serving at Edmonton Chinese Baptist Church for a year and a half or so, and he's here to uh, share God's word with us this morning. Do you want to open your Bibles with me? If you have Bibles, yeah. It's good to have your Bible with you when you come to church. Open it up to Luke chapter 10. And I think you all are familiar with this story because Wes did it just a couple of weeks ago. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. Anybody need a couple of Bibles or share some or something? Any more? Everybody pretty good? Okay, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. We're going to read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Are you guys okay with reading it out loud together? Like we all read it out loud at the same time? Is that cool? That's all right. We're going to start in verse 25. Luke chapter 10, starting to read in verse 25. That's kosher. We can all read it out together. I'm not going to break any unspoken rules or anything if we do that. Okay, good. Let's start to read. Verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love the, your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. It's always a lot more fun when you read this story. When you get to kind of verse 30 and 31, a man's going from, let's say he's just going from well, here to Taylor Seminary, okay? Like 10 block walk. He's going from here to there and he falls in the hands of robbers. He's beaten left half dead. Pastor Wes happens to be going along the same road and walks by and leaves him alone. Then too, Pastor Tawa comes along and sees this man laying there half dead and leaves him and keeps going. And then a homeless guy comes by and he takes care of the man. It's always good to try to contemporize it. It was the religious rulers of the day who passed by this man and would not help him. Interesting. I, I just like to do that when we read that story. Now I want you to flip back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. Okay. And while you're flipping there to Matthew chapter 7, did you know that a lot of people around the world today, throughout history, a lot of people admire Jesus. They really think that he was a great man. How many of you think Jesus was a pretty good guy? Well, we've almost got a majority. Almost a majority of us. Okay, is everybody awake now? How many of you think Jesus was a pretty good guy? Hands up. How many of you think he was a bad man? No one? Oh, okay. A lot of people also respect him as a great teacher and a great preacher. They may not accept him as their savior or their Lord, but they think he's a, a marvelous teacher. Indeed, the best maybe that ever lived. Now, personally, I don't think that Jesus left the option open for us to respect him as a teacher without accepting him as our savior and our Lord. But that doesn't change the fact that some people believe that way. Jesus is a great moral teacher, someone whom I respect. I don't know if you've heard that from people, but I have. Okay. And the verse that I want us to look at this morning and really focus on is one of the reasons for it. It's probably, probably, arguably, the most famous verse in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And it reads like this. 
So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Anybody here, is that the first time they've heard it? Anybody? No, you've all heard it before. Okay. This statement has come to be called the golden rule. And it has been central to Western moral and ethical philosophy since the time of Christ. Now today we're so familiar with this golden rule, with this one verse in the Bible, that it seems anything but new. It doesn't seem earth-shaking. It doesn't seem revolutionary because we're so familiar with it. Right? It's been around for 2,000 years now. Everyone at least knows the golden rule. So many people ask, well, what's the big deal? The golden rule seems almost self-evident today. But in Jesus' day, I think the statement would have been revolutionary. There were kind of similar teachings to the golden rule in ancient time. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, they all had a form of the golden rule, but it was always in the negative form. Do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. What's your name? You're a great overhead guy. What's your name? Matthew. Okay. Matthew, do you want to get punched in the nose? No? Don't punch anybody else in the nose. Then, okay? That's the golden rule according to ancient philosophy. If you don't want to have somebody punch you in the nose, don't punch them in the nose. You don't want people to kill you, don't kill other people. You don't want someone to steal your sheep, don't steal anyone else's sheep. Any shepherds in here? No. Oh, we do have a few. Cool. Liars. <laughs> We've got a few liars. If you don't want people to lie to you, don't lie to others. If you don't want people to gossip about you, don't gossip about other people. The golden rule had long been a philosophical expression in ancient society, but only in its negative form. Don't do to others what you don't want others to do to you. Jesus, for the first time, puts it in a positive form. So on everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Because this sums up the law and the prophets. So Jesus is commanding his disciples, not only are you to refrain from punching somebody else in the nose, but you are to do good things to other people in accordance with the way that you want other people to do good things to you. Now, most people throughout history and even in our society today would say, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good rule to live by. I, I think I kind of like that. Most people would admire this golden rule and say, yeah, it's a good teaching. But you know what's revolutionary about it is what would happen if people actually lived by it. If people actually applied the golden rule in their lives. Okay, it's one thing to respect a teaching, to respect the golden rule. It's something else altogether to actually apply it to ourselves. And I suggest that if God's people in the church were able to apply the golden rule in their lives, it would change the world. It truly would. It would bring revolutionary change to the whole world. And the funny thing is that Jesus actually expects his followers to apply the golden rule to their life. He doesn't expect us to just listen to it, to just hear it. He doesn't want us to just admire it, but then ignore it as it applies to us. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says! Don't just listen to the golden rule. Do it. We are not just to admire it. We are to do what it says. And what does it say? In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. The golden rule applies in every single aspect of our lives. There is not a single part of your life in which the golden rule does not apply. And we need to consider it carefully in everything that we do. And this morning, I want to spend most of our time applying the golden rule to various different areas of our life. But first, I want us to look at the last half of the golden rule. So on everything due to others, what you would have them do to you. Everybody knows that part. For this sums up the law and the prophets. There is one other place in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says that something sums up the law and the prophets. Does anybody other than people from my own church, because that would be cheating, does anybody else remember where it occurs? Anybody? Even Wes, you can do it too. Somewhere else in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says something sums up or is the total of the law and the prophets. Or let's put it this way, that the law and the prophets hang on this. Anybody remember it? Anybody got a guess? Guesses are good. Anybody got a guess? No? Okay, then it can be somebody from ECBC, the other ECBC. Yes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew chapter 22, verse 38 through 40. The wording is a little bit different, okay? In Matthew 22, Jesus says, the law and the prophets hang on these commandments. Whereas in Matthew 7, Jesus says the golden rule sums up the law and the prophets. But the meaning is the same. And do you see the similarity between the two commandments? So when everything do to others as you would have them do to you, love your neighbor as yourself. The second passage, love your neighbor as yourself, expresses like the philosophical underpinnings to the golden rule, which is the act of working out of the love command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. I want to look at two other passages real briefly that tie in with this. The first is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. And it reads, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Look to their interests above your own. Consider them to be ooh, more important than you. This is how we apply the golden rule to our lives with others. And then the passage we already read together, the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus finishes again with the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? Jesus tells this parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now the parable shows the Samaritan man putting the love command and the golden rule into practice. It wouldn't be loving to just pass by somebody who's lying half dead, bleeding to death on the side of the road. What's loving about that? Nothing. Vicky, where's Vicky? Where's Vicky? There she is, sorry, right in front of me. Okay, if, if, if somebody happened to say, mug you, you're walking, you're in university, right? Yeah, okay, you're, you're in the university, you've been studying late, and you're walking to the bus stop, somebody comes up behind you, bashes you over the head, takes your purse, and off they run. How would it feel to just lay there on the ground and have all these people walk by and maybe look at you, but just keep walking? How many people want to be treated that way? No one wants to be treated that way. And what Jesus is saying is if we in that situation would want to be helped, when we see somebody else in that kind of a situation, we need to help them. The way that we want to be treated is the way that we are to treat others. The parable of the Good Samaritan. The religious authorities of the day did not apply the love commandment in the parable that Jesus tells. Whether it was a true story or not, it's probably an element of truth in it. Now, before we look at some specific applications of the Golden Rule, I want to talk briefly about two things that the Golden Rule is not. The Golden Rule is not a promise that if we do things to others as we want them to do to us, that others will actually do to us what we want them to do to us. Did anybody get that? Or was that just confusing? Too many do's? Okay. The Golden Rule is not a reciprocal promise. That's what I'm saying. We can't take the Golden Rule and say, well, I've applied the golden rule. I don't beat anybody up, so I should expect that nobody will ever beat me up. It's not a reciprocal problem. We can hope that, and we should be able to expect it in our society, but we can't expect it, okay? To turn it around a bit, okay. If we say, okay, you know, I have tried real hard, and, and I think finally I'm at the point where I don't lie anymore. How many people think they're there? I I'm, I'm, don't think I'm quite there yet, okay? But let's just imagine that somebody, who's a really good person here? Somebody nominate somebody else who's really good. A good person. Mike Chung, where's Mike? <laughs> Mike Chung, okay. Mike, you've dealt with lying in your life. Congratulations, that's awesome, okay? That's a good thing. Way to go, Mike. So Mike no longer lies. <laughs> Mike cannot take the golden rule and say, well, hey, I don't lie. So you guys, you ain't allowed to lie to me anymore, okay? It's not what the golden rule means. We can't expect others to follow it with respect to us. The second thing about the golden rule that it is not, is it is not something that we are to apply to other people. Okay? It's not something that I am to try to apply to Joyce or to Vicky or to Alan or to anybody else. Okay? Something for me to apply to myself. Jesus delivers the golden rule to his disciples, to his followers. And they are to apply it to themselves. It's something that we apply critically in our own lives. Now, let's turn to applying the golden rule. Well, where to start? You know, every aspect of our life, I think we can apply the golden rule in. Do we want to talk about all of them? 
No, you don't. Where we should always start when we apply biblical truths is in the context that they fall in. Okay? The golden rule is delivered in Matthew chapter 7. So we should look at the context that it falls in and start applying it there. Now, in our church, we've been very slowly going through the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew's cha- Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We started last January, January 2002, and we're going to finish next Sunday, finally. The beginning of Matthew chapter 7 introduces the concept of judgment. Okay? Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. And this is the immediate context. Judgment is talked about for the first kind of 11 verses in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 7. Now, we don't have time to go through everything in relation to the beginning beginning of it, but if we look at the treatment that Jesus gives to the topic of judgment, we would see that he makes a distinction between at least three different types of judgment. Okay? There's some types of judgments that are just totally taboo, that we are not to do, and there is a form of judgment which we as Christians are called to exercise. Okay? We'll look at them very, very briefly, and then we'll go on. Okay? There's a distinction between three types of judgment. The first is soul judgment or eternal judgment. The second is hypercritical judgment. And the third is corrective judgment. Okay? Now, first, soul judgment. This one should be easy. Okay? Anybody here want somebody else standing up and judging their soul for eternity? Any of you want me judging your soul for eternity? Nobody? Oh, come on. Don't you trust me? You're all going to heaven. No, I'm kidding, okay? Well, yeah, then, okay, then you can judge my soul. Yeah, that's good. Okay, no, the point is throughout, throughout the Bible, it is emphasized very, very clearly that there is only one person who judges souls, and that's Jesus Christ, okay? We as human beings cannot say, Matthew, you're going to hell! We do not have the right to say that. Sorry, I don't mean to scare you. I'm just, no, making sure you're all awake. Okay, we don't have the right to say that. It's not our place as human beings. We cannot judge people's eternal destinies. It's not appropriate. And the golden rule applied to that makes it pretty obvious. I don't want Pastor West judging my soul. I don't want him saying, Tawa, I saw that car you drive. That car is going to take you straight to hell. Okay. <laughs> no. I don't want him judging my soul. I want God judging my soul. And even that's scary enough. Okay? But at least God knows. He knows everything. Okay? Application, if I don't want anyone standing in judgment over my soul, then I will not stand in judgment over the souls of other people either. I don't know who is going to heaven and who is going to hell. That is God's place and not mine. And we should never pretend otherwise. This was really brought home for me, actually. I wasn't going to say this, but I will. This was really brought home to me a week and a half ago. My grandma died a week and a half ago. And so we went out to Vernon for her funeral. That's why I missed the scavenger hunt. I was looking so forward to it, and I didn't even get to go. Anyway, sorry, that's just a side note. Um, But my grandma, I don't know whether she went to heaven or whether she went to hell. And it really bugged me, okay? Like, it really, really bugged me because I wanted to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm going to see my grandma in heaven one day. But I couldn't say that. I don't know that, okay? Anyways, second type of judgment, hypercritical judgment. You know what I mean by hypercritical judgment? You know, like the real critic, the person who's always picking things apart? Tawa. What kind of a tie is that? That is such a butt-ugly tie. I can't believe you're wearing it. To church, no less. Oh, that's atrocious. Anybody know what color of socks I'm wearing today? Anybody guess? Yeah, they're white. Well, they're kind of grayish. Who wears white socks with dress pants? Oh, I can't believe you do that. That's so bad. That's so wrong. I don't want people standing up and judging me for things like that. Anybody here play Uno? Don't you know it's a sin? I'm kidding. It's not. But I don't want people telling me that. I don't want people standing up and judging the little things in my life and saying, Oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you shouldn't do that. Now, some things are clear, okay? I do want people standing up and telling me some things, clearly. But you know what? Like fashion statements, who cares if my clothes don't match? Do you think God cares? I don't. That's why I don't always match in clothes. I don't, does this tie match the shirt? I don't even know. Vanessa, does it match? Yeah, okay. She didn't dress me this morning, so I'm not sure whether I match or not, okay? (laughs) I don't want people judging me for stuff like that. Anybody here a hockey fan? Oh, you guys! I can't believe you're hockey fans. Such a 
evil indulgence. I love hockey too. Okay. <laughs> you had a glass of champagne at a wedding? <gasps> oh yeah, I can't believe you did that. I don't want people being critical of me in that way, criticizing me for habits or actions which are not against the Word of God. Notice the addendum I put in there. Okay? For things that are not clearly against the Word of God. And application. If I don't want people being critical of me for stuff like that, then I cannot be critical of other people for stuff like that, even though those are ugly socks. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Third type of judgment, corrective judgment. How many people here, hands up, how many people here want other people to correct them if they are in sin or in error? Okay, not everybody, and that's okay. But yeah, I do. I really honestly do. For example, if I'm teaching Sunday school or if I'm here preaching and I teach something which is wrong, which is unknowingly wrong, for example, if I stood up here and said, God is hate. God wants us to spread hate to the world. I would really honestly want somebody to come up and correct me. Okay? Now I use that as an example because it's like so obviously dumb that even I wouldn't say that. Okay? But if I say something that is wrong, which is theologically wrong, I want to be corrected. Why? Well, because I don't want to have the air in my own head. Okay? I want to know rightly. But second, I don't want to lead other people down the wrong path either. Yeah, I want to be corrected if I say something wrong. Or a different example, if I'm engaging in a behavior which is against the will of God. Yeah, I want someone to correct me, to come up to me and say, hey, you, you know what? That, that's not right, what you're doing. It's just, it's wrong. Okay? If someone found out, I'm married, so I can say this, okay? With no shame, okay? If someone found out that I was sleeping with my girlfriend, yes, I would want them to come up to me and say, hey, you know what? Tell what that is against the word of God. What you are doing is sinful. It's wrong. You need to deal with it. I want somebody to correct me like that. Because then you can come back into right relationship with God. And if that is how I want to be treated as a member of God's family, then that's how I need to treat other people. To correct them when they are in sin or in error. Not notice to just sit back and to judge. Hey, psst, did you hear? Tom was having sex with his girlfriend. Oh, that's so bad. No, I want them to come to me and correct me. Okay? How about gossip? Any of you gossip ever in your life? None of you. Any of you lie in your life ever? <laughs> okay, well, hey, at least you're halfway honest. <laughs> That's good. I am convinced that nothing would stop gossip faster than people applying the golden rule in their life. After all, who wants other people to say nasty things about them behind their backs? Uh-uh. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I think we know who. <laughs> I won't say nothing. It's okay. How many of us want other people sticking their noses into our business where it doesn't belong? Anybody? <laughs> okay. I think she got the point. Okay. <laughs> if we don't want to be talked about behind our backs, if we don't want other people gossiping about us, then the application we should not gossip about other people either. The book of James has a wonderful description of the tongue. We went through the book of James in our church last year too. It was great fun. It describes the tongue as a spark or a raging fire which can destroy things. Okay? The tongue has a lot of power. And I'm not talking about kissing. I'm talking about talking. Okay? The tongue can spread great evil or it can spread great good. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29 encourages us to not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now, I know that I like it when other people encourage me and speak words of kindness to me. Hey, Tawa, those are nice socks. Even that feels good because I know they're not. <laughs> I like it when people encourage me. What's the application? I should encourage other people. I should be encouraging to them. I want to look now at two positive applications of the golden rule. Areas where we want to be positively treated in a particular way, and so we should also positively treat others in that fashion too. The first is acceptance or welcoming. How many of you have ever gone to a new school for the first time? If you don't put your hand up, I know you're sleeping. <laughs> You've all gone to a new school for the first time. We've all had that experience of going to a new church or a new, new school, um, being the new kid in a new city, okay? 
Or some of you maybe have the experience of going, coming to Canada for the first time. Okay? It can be very awkward. Depending on the place, depending on the people, we can feel real uncomfortable. We can feel very unwanted. As a visitor or a newcomer, it is very warming to be greeted, to be lovingly greeted by someone. Or to have someone kind of take you by the hand and lead you around, introduce you to other people and so on. It's nice to be welcomed when you're a newcomer. So as Christians, part of the golden rule is helping newcomers or visitors to feel welcome and loved at our church, at your school, at your workplace, in your Sunday school class, wherever it may be. That is our calling as believers. Do to others what you would have them do to you. Lastly, I want to look at evangelism or the sharing of the gospel. Now as Christians, we have received what we know to be the greatest gift on earth. We have heard the gospel. We have understood that God loves us deeply. We know that Jesus Christ came from heaven and lived on earth. We have acknowledged that we are sinners in need of the grace of God. We have been shown that Jesus Christ died on the cross in order to pay the penalty that our sins demand. And it is only by accepting Christ's sacrifice that we can be forgiven, that we can receive eternal life. Those of us who are Christians have accepted salvation. We have received this priceless gift. And we recognize the gospel to be the greatest gift. Now, what do you do with great gifts? It's mine. No, you share it. We know the difference it's made for us. And we want it to make that difference for other people. The gospel has rescued us from the condemnation we deserve. It's brought us the promise of eternal life. This is great stuff, guys. We want to share that blessing with others. We want to share the gift. If we love others as ourselves, we don't want them to not hear the gospel. I know that's a double negative, but deal with it. We want them to hear the gospel. Why? So that they can respond to it. So they can receive the love of God in their own lives. So they can be redeemed. In other words, we actively share our faith with those who do not yet have faith in Jesus Christ. The golden rule is a call to evangelism. I wouldn't be a Christian today if someone had not decided that this was a good enough gift to bother sharing with a schmuck like me. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Now we haven't looked at everything this morning, but I want you to think about it when you go home, when you go to school, I want you to think about how can I apply the golden rule in this situation. Okay, what does it mean? How does it work out? You know, a lot of golden objects are kind of treated with a lot of respect. They're put behind a glass door or they're put in museums for people to admire and to look at and say, wow, that's beautiful. The golden rule is not like that. It is, yes, to be admired and yes, it's to be treated with respect. But it's to get dirty. Okay, we're to get this golden rule dirty. How do you get it dirty? You get it dirty by applying it in your lives. Okay, by dragging it everywhere you go, even when it's through the mud, through the dirt, through the sand, everywhere. It often is hard for us. It goes contrary to what comes naturally to apply the golden rule. It's difficult to treat others the way that we want to be treated. But this is what honors God and shows that we do love our neighbor. Let's pray. Our Lord God, we just thank you for the gift that you have given to us, the gift of salvation that you freely offer to each and every person. Lord, your desire is that all should come to faith, that no one should perish without knowing you as their Savior. And Lord, that is our prayer too. We don't want our friends, our family, our classmates. We don't want them to live outside of your grace. We want them to know it. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to apply the golden rule and to share our faith with others. Lord, we pray that each one of us would be able to look at our lives and see where we need to apply the golden rule, places where, where we are not treating others the way that we would want to be treated. Lord God, we just pray, we earnestly pray, Lord God, that your spirit would work a wonder within each one of us, that you would change us from the inside out. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.